Today I'm joined by Daniel Imovar. Daniel Imovar is uh, an Associate Professor of History at Northwestern University. Uh, he specializes in 20th century US history within a global context. He's the author of this uh, fantastic book, How to Hide an Empire, A Short History of the Greater United States. So for people who aren't familiar with your work and who you are, could you just give us a bit of background into um, why you're writing about what you're writing about and what your re research interests? Sure. Uh, so I'm a U.S. historian, um, and I started this project uh, as a teacher, really, before I was a researcher. Um, I was teaching, I was a graduate student in California, and I was teaching in a, a prison there, San Quentin State Prison, uh, and I was teaching the U.S. History Survey. So it's this kind of classic, um, you know, time-worn survey. It's, it's It's so standardized at this point that you know, if I were sick one day and I, you know, called in a colleague and say, we're at, we're at the Jacksonian era, can you take over? You know, she'd know exactly what to talk about. Um, and, and I was teaching that and it was really interesting and I'd had a lot of conversations with, the, um, with my students. Uh, but then kind of in the middle of that process, um, I took a research trip to Manila in the Philippines and I touched down and I thought, you know, this place looks sort of, uncannily familiar and yet different. I mean, there were so many aspects of the United States and its, you know, architectural legacy and its history and its commerce that is just in instantly recognizable. So there are streets named after U.S. presidents, uh, you know, up to like Eisenhower, uh, a um, transit system that is based on repurposed U.S. Army jeeps. Uh, and I'd meet people who not only spoke English, but spoke English with my sort of accent. Um, and, you know, none of this is entirely a shock, but, um, you know, I'd known that the Philippines had been a colony of the United States, um, but there's a difference between um, reading the lyrics and hearing the music, and suddenly I was able to hear the music. And I, I just thought, why isn't this a big part of my teaching? Why don't I think about this more, the fact that the Philippines, which is an enormous country, uh, for half a century had been part of the United States, a colony of the United States. And then, you know, one doesn't think about that very long before one's thoughts turn to other places like Puerto Rico and Hawaii before it's a state and Guam and Alaska. And you start wondering about other places under U.S. jurisdiction, like the military bases. Uh, and, and so I thought, you know, I think I've been teaching U.S. history wrong because I've been teaching U.S. history where places like the Philippines sort of make a cameo appearance. Um, when I talk about the moment when the United States acquired them, most of them around uh, 1898. And then they just disappear. They're not part of the story. They're not part of how I talk about the New Deal. They're not, talk about how I, they're not part of how I talk about World War II. They're not talk, part of how I talk about the Cold War. Uh, and, and, and it just struck me how, how um, insufficient that was. So, I mean, and that was many years ago. So I, I, I started thinking more seriously about um, places like the Philippines and Puerto Rico and where they fit into U.S. history. And, and the result is that book that you just uh, held up that was very kind of you, by the way. Um, and what, what it attempts to do is to re-narrate U.S. history, but where the unit of analysis, the geographical basis, the thing that you're giving the history of, is not just, as it so often is, um, that sort of contiguous blob, right, that shape that's so familiar, uh, but it's that the whole United States, all the places that are that are technically part of the United States. Uh, and, and I also include some places that are not annexed by, but are under the jurisdiction of, of, of the United States. So basically all the places where the stars and stripes fly. Um, and it turns out that when you do that, you get a dramatically different version of U.S. history. Um, some things that had, you know, seemed so familiar to me suddenly appeared in a new light. Uh, other events that I'd barely heard of uh, suddenly seemed really important to me uh, and just the sort of tenor and rhythm of it changed so so that's the book so when you say the u.s is an empire what do you mean by that well i mean there's a lot of things that you can mean by it and i think sometimes the conversation can get a little muddied by how many different things we can mean by that so one thing that you can mean is that the united states is um has a level of international power that makes it not just a sort of uniquely, you know, militarily well-equipped country, but, but has the ability to order around or to coordinate the actions of other countries, uh, financially, militarily, diplomatically, in all kinds of ways. And that's true of the United States. And if you want to call that um, empire, you're absolutely welcome to. Um, however, there's also a more modest definition 
uh, which I think everyone would agree on, uh, which is that an empire is a country that has colonies and outposts. And by that more modest definition, I'm not ruling out the other one, I'm just saying by, by even by this most modest of definitions, um, the United States is an empire uh, and it has been an empire. Uh, and I mean, it, it is, it, it's funny, the, the, the name of the country is the United States of America. And you think that what that means, it's like a, a very descriptive name, right? It's not like Germany. Uh, and and it, it kind of, you know, it, you know, tells you what's in the tin, but it's wrong uh, because of, from day one, when the United States got its um, independence from uh, Great Britain ratified, uh, it wasn't a, a union of states. It was a collection of states and territories. It was like that on day one. Uh, it's like that now, and it's been like that on every day in between. So you talk about this quite a lot. Um, the language is quite important. So it, it shifts from colonies to territories. Um, what are the reasons for that, and what effect does it have? Yeah, so let's talk about So it's there's an interesting thing in the mainland of the United States, which is uh, that's what most people think of as being the only part of the United States, but it is just a part of it. Uh, in the mainland, there's a kind of lexical avoidance behavior around the C word, uh, colonies. I mean, that's a, them's fighting words, right, to say that the United States has colonies. So, uh, so what do you call a place like Guam? And the answer is those places are by and large called, at least by officials, territories. Now, what is the legal difference between a territory and a colony? There is none. And um, as you kind of alluded to, at, at the moment of acquisition, when the United States, these aren't the first overseas place the United States claims, but when it, when it claims a, a large number of them sort of all together uh, around 1898, there is a lot of open talk from men like Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, uh, who just forthrightly described the United States as being an empire and having colonies, because that's what the Philippines is. Uh, and then what's interesting is that you see a kind of retreat in the United States, and an, 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 an unusual one, uh, in the sense that the United States continues having an empire, continues having overseas territories, uh, but it, it gets very cherry about referring to them as such. Uh, so you see a kind of um, semantic movement from referring to the United States as an empire, uh, with colonies to referring to it as a nation with territories and and often those territories don't even get referred to uh, at all so I mean one thing I try to document in the book is how obtuse uh, mainlanders can be about the existence of you know places like American Samoa and I don't think that's just a um, you know lack of sharp wittedness I think that that's a learned behavior um, I am from Pennsylvania I was educated in Pennsylvania and New York uh, and you know, at no point in my education, as far as I can recall, uh, did I ever get to see a map of the United States that had Puerto Rico on it, right? Like every map of the United States I had didn't have places like Puerto Rico on it. And that's why when I thought about the United States, I didn't really think very hard about the US Virgin Islands, for example. I think the most interesting story you tell in the book is Pearl Harbor. Um, and there's, there's a general story in the way that it gets taught in history. It's, you know, um, Pearl Harbor gets bombed and then, you know, the U.S. En enters the war. But you, you see a much, uh, you, should, you see a bigger story behind that, don't you? Yeah, so the Pearl Harbor thing is, it's such an important part of the um, U.S. mythology about, you know, like it's a, it's a huge moment in history. I think um, if you were to ask most people in the United States which historical um, events they could put a date to, not just a year, but a date, I think you would only get three. Um, and it's telling which, which three they are. So uh, July 4th, 1776, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, everyone in the United States knows what date that happened. Um, September 11th, 2001, Al-Qaeda's attack. People know what date that happened. We, the name of it is the date, September 11th. Um, and the other one would be um, December 7th, 1941, which is known in this country as the date which will live in infamy because of a famous speech by um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the president at the time. Uh, which, you know, there's like 350 books written about this event that are in the Library of Congress. Um, and the story that we usually tell is exactly as you, as you phrased it. The story is that um, this is the, the attack. So it's an attack on Pearl Harbor, which is uh, a naval base in Hawaii that draws the United States into World War II, but then has the bizarre distinction of having been the only piece of U.S. soil that has been struck uh, in the entire war, and, and for the rest of the war, the United States fights fights a foreign war. And when I say that's the story, 
I don't just mean that that's what most people on the street would say if I were to go outside my street in Chicago and ask people. I mean, you know, Richard Nixon described it like that, and he fought in the Pacific during World War II. And the reason I find that interesting, and I'm sort of saying that with a tone of disbelief, is that it's not even remotely true. So what actually happens is this. Uh, it's not just that Japan attacks uh, the territory of Hawaii, which is not yet a state, it's, a, it's an overseas territory. Um, it's also that within hours, Japan attacks uh, Guam, which is a, uh, another U.S. territory, Wake Island, which is another U.S. territory, uh, the Philippines, which is the single largest colony that the United States has, as well as the uh, British territories of Hong Kong and Malaya uh, and the independent kingdom of Thailand. That all happens basically as the same event within a span of hours. Um, sometimes it gets a little confusing about when it happens because uh, it's such a large event in terms of its geographical extent that it actually occurs on either side of the international date line. So from um, Tokyo's perspective, uh, the date which we'll live in infamy, first of all, it wasn't infamy, it was glory. Uh, and second of all, it was December 8th, because that's what time it is, and that's what day it is in Tokyo when it happens, uh, and that's the day it is on some of the targets. Um, and, and so it's not just that, you know, the story that most people in the United States tell about Pearl Harbor is, is a truncated one. Uh, it also and misses a really important point, which is that Japan is attacking the United States' empire and is trying to claim the United States' as Pacific empire and does do it. I mean, the attack on Pearl Harbor is in some ways a red herring because that place, in that location, Japan attacks, does great military damage, but then leaves it, right? Doesn't come back uh, and doesn't, doesn't hit Hawaii for the rest of the war. Uh, contrast that with the Philippines, where Japan attacks, does great military damage, and according to the Army's official history, as great as it did at Pearl Harbor, but then uh, attacks again, invades, and occupies. And the Philippines is um, Japanese-held territory uh, for the bulk of the war. That's also true of Guam. That's also true of Wake Island. And then there's an attack later that gives the western part of Alaska to Japan. So these are major parts of the United States that are occupied, and, and quite brutally so, uh, by Japan during World War II. And, you know, in the Philippines, we think that the death toll from that war is over a million Filipinos. And if you add Japanese and U.S. mainlanders, we're talking about, you know, a million, million and a half people who die uh, in that war. And that's like no part of how most U.S. historians conceive of what happened in World War II or how to narrate that war. Um, that's the bloodiest war that ever happened in U.S. history. That's the bloodiest event that ever happened in U.S. history. And it's just like doesn't even count because the Philippines sort of exists on the periphery of the United States for most people when they're talking about the United States and its history. So you, you say in the, uh, of the greater history of the, the United States that there's three main currents to it. So there's the westward expansion, there's the annexation of various territories, and then there's a stage where the US actually gives up some of its territory, doesn't it? So can you give us just a, a brief description of what happens in each stage? Sure. So, uh, I mean, the first stage is, is the most famous one. Um, if you, you don't have to know a lot about U.S. history to know that it, uh, the country starts off smaller uh, than, it, than it becomes by the middle of the 19th century. Um, and so in some ways, that's a very familiar story. And it's a story about um, conquest and purchasing of land and the dis dispossession of indigenous populations. Um, but I think one thing to note about that is that uh, the way that works is that it, it, it feeds on the fact that the United States is not just states. Um, the way that the United States expands is by claiming new land and then making that land not immediately into states, but into territories. And that can take quite a long time. In fact, the average um, time from uh, acquisition to statehood uh, for any territory that's claimed by the United States is 45 years, which is you know not a small amount of time. Uh, and that means some of these uh, lands are held in territorial purgatory or held as kind of colonies uh, before they become states for, well, in the case of Oklahoma, over a century, right, which is longer than, um, you know, uh, the Dutch held, uh, sorry, uh, longer than uh, the French held Indochina, longer than the uh, Belgians and King Leopold held the Congo. Um, so I think that's a kind of, that came as a surprise to me when I, when I sort of did all the math and figured that out. Um, the second phase is, is the one that gets much more attention in, in the book, um, is that the United States expands overseas. And I think there are surprises, well, I guess I'll, I'll name two. One is how quickly it happens. Um, so the, the board, if you just imagine the borders of the United States, there's probably a shape that you can think of, right? You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, this contiguous shape. Um, that, those, that shape actually corresponds to the borders of the country for three years, 
there are three years of US history where those are the right borders. And the reason is that right after the United States fills out its familiar continental profile, it starts going overseas uh, and it starts claiming a series uh, first of uninhabited islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean, almost a hundred of them, um, then taking Alaska, which is this enormous landmass, uh, and then Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Hawaii, U.S. Virgin Islands. I mean, there's just this whole, you know, kind of um, cascade of, 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 of annexations. Um, and the second surprise about that is that, uh, you know, it's so easy from the perspective of the U.S mainland to not really think very hard about those overseas territories but um by the height of sort of the u.s colonial empire let's say around the, around the time of pearl harbor um one in eight u.s nationals live uh in the overseas territories we're talking 19 million people this is it's not the size of the british empire but it's not that small either um and just for a sense of comparison if you live in the united states in 1940 meaning the whole united states not just the mainland um, you are more likely to be colonized than you are to be black. That's how many colonized people there are as part of the United States. Uh, and if you live in the United States in 1940, the whole part, not just the uh, contiguous part, you are more likely to be colonized than you are to be an immigrant. That's how many colonized people there are in the United States. Um, the third part of this story is, is sort of an ambiguous one. So on the one hand, the United States partly decolonizes in the sense that um, its largest colony, the Philippines, uh, gets independence in 1946. Um, two of its other large territories, Hawaii and Alaska, meet a different fate. They become states, uh, which is this really interesting story and kind of, from one perspective, uh, uh, an achievement of civil rights from another perspective, a doubling down on a colonization. Um, but, but as that, you know, as the United States kind of divests itself from, you know, a more familiar form of colonial empire, it also invests in, in a new territorial kind of empire, which is military bases, more military bases than any country has ever had, you know, with a geographic extent that is just mind boggling. So um, as a result of World War II, the United States gets a basing system of hundreds of bases. We think it has about 800 uh, overseas and territorial bases today. Um, just all over the map. And, and those, if you take all the known bases that the, uh, the bases that the military will cop to uh, and will report in its annual basing report, and you mass them all together, we are talking about a land area that is not that much bigger than the city of Houston. So not a lot of land, but as I try to show in the book, those little points all over the planet, they matter a lot for US history. And frankly, they matter a lot for global history too. What do the daily lives look like for people living inside these territories, so in Puerto Rico or in the Philippines? It varies. Uh, it's complicated, as of course it is, right, as you would expect it to be. Um, but I think that one constant that folks who live in U.S. territories uh, have to deal with is, is this weird sense of subordination and, and failure to be included or counted. Um, so you know, for example, the United States is quite proud of its constitution and particularly its Bill of Rights, uh, which extend a number of rights to, you know, anyone who lives in the United States. But the Supreme Court has uh, ruled that living in the United States is a complicated matter because if you live in the uh, unincorporated overseas territories, those aren't the United States in a constitutional sense. So uh, the constitution doesn't automatically apply to such places, which means that, so I'm in, talking to you from Chicago, uh, were I to travel to San Juan in Puerto Rico right now and disembark, uh, I would lose my constitutional right to trial by jury. Were I to come back to Chicago, I would regain it. And the reason is that the United States is not a homogenous legal space. Um, you know, and there's also a lot of just cultural stuff that goes along with that. So. You know, being part of the U.S. empire generally varies a little from place to place, but um, usually means uh, an education system in English at various points in history, uh, and that can feel like a major imposition. Um, it means, or has meant, um, having to celebrate not just like 4th of July, imagining like having to celebrate the U.S. independence from empire while in a U.S. colony, uh, but at various times, uh, U.S. colonial subjects have also had to um, celebrate Occupation Day, the time that the United States occupied their country. Um, and, you know, it's not entirely unique. Um, these kind of humiliations occur throughout empire, but um, they've very much been a part of the United States' empire. One of the most interesting chapters is about language. So you, you've just touched on it there about the spread of the English language. So what does the study of language tell you about the, the greater history of the United States? Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, I, I, I think we don't shout this from the rooftops loudly enough, but it is amazing 
an extraordinary fact that English has become, well, it's, it's funny to call it a lingua franca, <laughs> but, uh, but has, has become a universal, a universally accessible language to the degree that no language ever has. So um, we think about um, one in four people on the planet can speak English pretty well, and, and that those one in four are not um, distributed randomly. The more powerful you are, the more connected you are, the more likely it is you'll speak English. Uh, and I mean, Latin never had this extent, Spanish, Arabic, Swahili never had this extent, uh, French never had this extent despite being a lingua franca. Um, and, and so it's kind of amazing that this one language has, you know, colonized the globe. Uh, and so I talk about the mechanisms by which that happens. So uh, obviously empire, formal empire played a big role, um, both the British, I mean, English is, you know, also the language of, 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 of Great Britain as well. So the British empire uh, was, really important in um, seeding English language instruction, you know, throughout the world. Uh, but the U.S. empire did that as well. Interestingly enough, that I don't think was enough to, to cinch it. Um, by 19, you know, the 1940s, there's this incredible exchange between FDR and Churchill as they're thinking about the post-war future. And Churchill particularly, they're both nervous about this, but Churchill particularly is obsessed with English. He's like, how do we get the world to speak English? And the reason that's an interesting question is that Churchill is not satisfied that there's been enough English language instruction to ensure this, not at all. In fact, uh, the decolonization or the dismantling of empires means um, that a lot of newly freed uh, colonies want to return to some non-European language, often an indigenous language, and get highly, specific, highly suspicious of English. Um, so Churchill is you know, thinking, well, maybe if we just restrict English to 350 words and 18, 18 of which are verbs called basic English, maybe we can get foreigners to speak that kind of English. And he's willing to do that. I mean, Churchill's this incredible user of the English language. He's basically willing to restrict himself to, you know, a toy piano. Uh, and, uh, and FDR is, is openly considers, um, you know, maybe if we uh, write English in a non-Roman script, um, then it will be, then we can have phonetic alphabet so we don't have to deal with all the, you know, really um, cruel spelling aspects of English that are so difficult for non-English speakers to master. And it's just like this incredible moment where you realize they're not convinced at all that English is going to prevail. And so in the book, I try to account for this um, kind of uh, process of globalization whereby the United States is able to get a colonial privilege, which is, you know, people all over the world speaking its home language um, without colonizing. Uh, and I talk a little bit about how the military bases uh, feature in that, but also about how the United States develops a number of sort of border crossing technologies that allow it to, to some degree, replace um, colonization, which is where you annex a foreign place and, and you know, take it within your borders uh, with globalization, which is where you extend your processes uh, across borders uh, into foreign countries and nevertheless are able to get some level of coordination. And you say in the 1930s, like a, a reader of the New York Times was more likely to hear about Brazil or Poland than they were to hear about the Philippines, which was yeah. actually part of the United States. So do you still think that's the case today that um, the, the US empire is still obscured and hidden? Um, we are seeing an amazing change in that regard. Um, the Puerto Rico particularly is suddenly appearing in mainland newspapers uh, in a way that it just hadn't 10 years ago. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the news is bad. Um, so uh, hurricanes and uh, budgetary crises, but, uh, and you know, the Trump administration has not made it any easier. In fact, I think Trump has played a, an active role in, exp I mean, like in, as he does in so many ways, uh, you know, as we say, he says the quiet part out loud. Uh, and, and so he, got into, in the aftermath of a series of hurricanes, got into this sort of shouting match uh, with the mayor of San Juan and this very antagonistic relationship uh, with Puerto Rico where he was basically saying the quiet part out loud. Uh, and he started referring to Puerto Rico as a sort of separate entity. So he's, he'll say things like, I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget out of whack. And, you know, it doesn't take a super sharp ear to hear the, you know, who's the, who's the, we and who's the they there? Who's, where's the here and, and where's the there? And he's basically sort of laying bare uh, a kind of enduring fact about Puerto Rico's relationship to the larger polity in which it is enmeshed, the United States. Um, and I think partly because of that, we are, we're seeing 
all of the colonies getting a little more news coverage. Um, and that feels really important to me. That's actually true of the military bases too. Um, it used to be a kind of such an unspoken assumption that the United States would maintain its basing network, uh, that there was no point talking about it politically. It's not the kind of thing that came up. Uh, but Trump, you know, was kind of consistently threatened to close military bases to get money to build his wall. So now suddenly you have to talk about why there need to be military bases in the first place. Uh, so in that respect, it's been a really interesting moment, um, although I can't say entirely a, a hopeful one. And how does the US empire develop during the war on terror years? Um, so what you see in the war on terror is those military bases turn out to matter a lot. Uh, and they matter in, in two ways. One is, and I think we don't talk about this enough, uh, it's ultimately military bases that provoke Al-Qaeda's actions. It's not the only provocation, and I don't want to blame it all on you know, US policy. I mean, clearly Osama bin Laden has um, some pernicious views that I would not endorse. Um, but um, there's a, a, a series of bases in Saudi Arabia, particularly one uh, called Dharan, which the, uh, bin Laden has this sort of biographical connection to because his father helped to build it. Um, that, so these are US bases, they're in Saudi Arabia and they had been opened but then closed and then the bases are reopened again um, during the Gulf War. And that becomes the issue that Osama bin Laden grabs onto because he thinks, oh my God, you are stationing infidels in the Holy Land of Mecca and Medina. How is the Saudi government okay with this? How am I okay with this? How are Saudis okay with this? Um, and this becomes a sort of way of talking about not just that particular base, but about the stationing of U.S. troops you know, throughout the Middle East, uh, throughout uh, Muslim lands. Uh, and it becomes a rallying cry and something that Al-Qaeda can use for recruitment. Uh, so bases are the sort of provocation in that sense. I mean, there is sort of the uh, issue that uh, bin Laden keeps returning to over and over and over again. Um, but uh, they also become the targets, right? So you know, that base gets bombed and uh, El uh, bin Laden takes credit. Um, and then when the United States starts engaging after 2001 in a sort of comprehensive war on terror, the military bases are so important to the um, prosecution of that war. Uh, that war only works if U.S. forces can kind of get everywhere, right? It's a war that takes place all over the planet. Um, and, and it just sort of quickly spins out from being just about Afghanistan or Iraq to suddenly, you know, you have to explain why uh, you know, two years ago, uh, four U.S. service members were killed in action in Niger, it, like, as somehow as part of the war on terror. And, you know, senators didn't even know there were U.S. troops in Niger. And, but actually, there are four U.S. bases there. And so, and there, <laughs> there are bases, all, you know, 800 of them all over the planet. Uh, and, and, and the idea of, that the United States can project force anywhere and sort of take part in this diffuse warfare that, that happens in, in, in all kinds of locations, that depends on this um, basing network that, again, doesn't have a huge footprint in terms of acreage, but, but those little pinpoints matter. And you talk about the role of technology in maintaining the empire. What role does that play? Yeah, so I got really interested in how um, technology helped the United States transition from a more familiar form of colonial empire to an empire that I mean, still includes colonies. Five, the United States has five inhabited territories, millions of people live in them. But um, but it seems like the main emphasis from Washington's perspective, the thing it cares the most about are these, are these hundreds of bases. And, and I, I got really interested in how technology allows the United States to distance itself from colonialism as a form of empire and invest in what I call pointillism as, as, as an, its imperial form. Um, and, and a lot of those have to do with, uh, first, its ability to sort of not deal with large swaths of land. So it, it used to be the case that if you, as a you know, potential imperial power, wanted to control some foreign bit of land, you tended to have to control things around it and the routes to it, um, both for communication and for transportation. Um, planes and radio and other wireless forms of communication offer point-to-point um, transportation and communication rather than contiguous. So you don't have to run a railroad or, or uh, a, a ship. Um, you can just, you know, hop a plane. Uh, and the United States gets really good at a lot of these um, surface hopping technologies and that allows it to, to just focus on the points. Uh, at the same time, one major impetus toward, uh, for empire was that um, tropical products are really important to industrial economic processes. And um, that had been true up through the 1940s. And one reason why um, the war with Japan is so 
dire for the United States is that Japan has cut the United States off from a lot of tropical commodities that it could either source through uh, its colonies or source through, um, you know, more likely uh, source through British and French colonies. Um, and and I talk about how during that war, the United States got really good at um, replacing a lot of those can't do without them um, tropical commodities like rubber uh, or silk uh, with uh, petroleum byproducts with, with plastic, basically. And so I, it's, it's interesting. We don't th we think of plastic as an environmental hazard, as indeed it is, but it's also a kind of incredible anti-colonial material because it, it makes colonies from the perspective of would-be imperialists. It makes them a, a lot less necessary. Uh, you can do a lot more economically. You can, you know, have all these uh, you can make all these products uh, without relying on all these different spots in the globe to source them uh, because you can just substitute plastic or, or some kind of synthetic material. And another key theme is conflict, I think. So you talk about the Philippines war and it, it lasts from 1899 until 1913, which is actually the second longest conflict in American history, I believe. Um, could you tell us a bit about what happens in those years? Yeah. So um, the what is the longest conflict uh, is is a contested thing, and and you can make cases for different begin dates and end dates for various wars. But um, the the, the I, I mean, by my reckoning, the uh, the war in the Philippines that starts in eighteen ninety nine is the second longest the war in Afghanistan that's ongoing, being the longest. Um, either way, it's a very very long war, and what happens is the United States annexes the Philippines as part of a it's, it's very weird. It enters a war that Spain is fighting against its own colonial subjects in the Philippines, in the Cuba, in Cuba, in Puerto Rico. And, and it enters on the side of the rebels, so against the Spanish Empire. Uh, but then it, by the end of the war, it, it, it comes to oppose the Spanish Empire in a different sense, not as a, a force for liberation, but as a rival, <laughs> rival empire. And, and it ends the war by claiming not all, but a number of Spain's colonies in which the fighting had taken place, uh, including the Philippines. So from the perspective of Filipino nationalists, they are fighting a war against empire, against the Spanish empire, with the United States as a helper uh, and as a, as a sort of crucial form of assistance. And then suddenly they have to fight the United States. And this leads to just an interminable war. Um, you know, a lot of the fighting takes place in the north uh, at first, and that's where a lot of the sort of uh, big uh, newspaper headlines come come out of. Uh, but it just keeps going on, and particularly keeps going on in the southern Philippines, in, in a, a region called Moro Land. Um, and and it's not until 1913 that the United States entirely um, uh, that sorry that the United States entirely uh, turns the Philippines to uh, civilian rule. Uh, up until then, it is martial law, and at least some some part of the Philippines, and there's ongoing combat. Um, and, you know, we think the war, the numbers are very hard to come by, but, um, and most of the people, as, as usual, in, in wars of this type, die from disease, but we think that the war killed, you know, maybe three quarters of a million people, which means that it is bloodier than the U.S. Civil War. Um, and, you know, and it's also a war of secession. It also takes place in the 19th century. Uh, and, and yet, you know, find a U.S. history textbook that appreciates that fact, right? You know, that the Philippine War usually shows up, uh, but but the sense of magnitude of scale of just how big of an event this is, I mean, that's something that uh, I think it's hard for U.S. historians or has been hard for U.S. historians to wrap their heads around. And how do you think in terms of strength and power does the U.S. empire compare to the British empire, the Roman empire, other great empires that have existed through history? Um, it's hard because, well, it certainly has a different shape. Uh, and, you know, having, rather than having, you know, colonies that go from, you know, you know, the sun never, they're, they're so extensive that the sun never sets on them. Um, the United States has five inhabited territories now and a lot of bases. Is that a strength or a weakness? It's certainly less territorially impressive, um, but it also allows the United States to have quite a lot of flexibility. And I mean, arguably the United States has, um, strategically benefited from being able to enjoy a lot of the, the um, profits of empire without having to bear a lot of the responsibilities with this new pointillist form that it has pioneered. Um, and it, it's interesting that, you know, that's the thing that China seems to be, you know, intent on imitating. Uh, not only uh, it, it, has a mil it has a foreign military base in Djibouti, but it has also um, created synthetic islands, artificial islands uh, that can also function as, as you know, 
points in its uh, budding pointillist empire. Um, so, you know, in terms of world power, I think there's nothing that really compares to the United States right after World War II. Uh, there's no level of global dominance that really um, matches that level of asymmetry between one country and, and, and the rest of the world. Um, but there's been a recession of U.S. power since then. And right now we're in an interesting moment of um, hegemonic transformation. Um, you know, arguably the United States has lost a lot of its uh, power that it had right after World War II, but it's also hung on to a lot of the institutions around that power, including the basing system. And I think that's why we're seeing a crisis, right? It's sort of the underlying economic basis is no longer uh, there, no longer there in, in as much magnitude, and yet the sort of uh, institutions still remain, and, and that creates a kind of friction and, you know, tectonic tension and, and possibly a crisis. What developments have we seen under the Trump presidency in terms of the empire? Um, you know, I think it's always tempting to see Trump as, as the aberration, but I, or as the culmination perhaps, uh, but I, I, I see him as fairly normal uh, in terms of the uh, overseas territories, except that he just says it all in a cruder way. So, you know, I told you that Trump has this way of speaking of the overseas territories uh, as, you know, there are them, you know, rather than in us. Uh, and, but, you know, that's not very different from how Woodrow Wilson said it when he said that there's a, uh, the overseas territories lie outside of the charmed circle of our national life. I mean, Wilson's way of putting it was more eloquent, but it's basically the same sentiment. So uh, under Trump, I just see a sort of starker version of, of a reality that had been ongoing for quite some time. And, you know, you can read that in one of two ways. One is that, you know, the starkness is, is, is doubly offensive, right? Uh, or that the starkness exposes a reality that had been hidden for too long and we're finally getting it out in the open and at least that's some form of progress. And what do you think the rise of China means for the empire? I don't know. Um, I mean, I think my guess is that the US basing system is gonna contract, not expand in terms of number of locations in the, in the coming decade or two. Um, and that's partly because, you know, I think the United States is in some metaphorical sense losing ground. And I think in some actual sense, it might, as a result, lose ground. Uh, the bases tend to irritate host nations. Um, and so, and that's, there's been a lot of base closures sort of, you know, after the early war on terror. Um, and I think China's ability to dislodge the United States as the hegemonic power is probably going to play some role in that. Um, another reason I think we can expect to see the United States um, territorially contract rather than expand uh, is also the further development and honing of its technologies. I think the better its uh, planes get, uh, the fewer you know, stopping places they need, and the, the more the United States can, can sort of do more with less. And we saw this during the war on terror, but there's, there is a certain lobby within the United States that actually thinks that expansion and the accentuation of U.S. empire is a good thing. What, you, what would you say to those people? Yeah, I mean, my sense is that colonialism has not been historically the, um, the best form of government. <laughs> I think my book reveals just some of the inanity, some of the cruelty, um, the way it kind of reinforces and feeds on racism. All of that is, is a big part of the history of colonialism. And for that reason, I would be extremely hesitant to see the further expansion of the United States. I don't really think that's on the table, although there was a... Um, sort of kerfuffle uh, not too, uh, in the not too far distant past when Trump spoke of purchasing Greenland and his great desire to buy Greenland. You know, and I, I don't think anyone was, if, aside from perhaps Trump and, and uh, uh, Tom Cotton, uh, I don't think it was really serious in that. Certainly it wasn't, a, wasn't an option. And, and so in some ways you see Trump as just kind of, you know, grasping for some way of understanding a, a reality that is probably a little more complex uh, than he can handle. Um, and, and, and one of the realities that he didn't seem to grasp is that the United States actually has, has enjoyed effective control of what it needs in Greenland. It has the ability to purchase at, 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 at good prices um, mineral resources from Greenland. That's one reason why Greenland might be of interest uh, to Washington. And the United States has maintained um, a really valuable military base there. And it's been, you know, nuclear weapons on that base, um, despite um, the objections of the government. Uh, so it's, it's had a lot of discretionary power and ability to use Greenland without having to colonize the whole place. So I think the idea that uh, the United States would sort of revert and, and go on a, a colonial binge is, is hard to imagine for me. So the book's called How to Hide an Empire. So how do you hide an empire in the 21st century? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think we see it. The, the, the really distinctive and interesting thing about the United States is how little it has grappled with its overseas territory. Um, you know, it, there's a holiday in Britain that starts in the schools and, and becomes official in 1916 called Empire Day. And people are, uh, school children are enjoying to celebrate the empire, dress up in national costume, look at the map on the wall with all the parts painted red. Uh, and interestingly, the United States has a chronologically identical counterpart holiday. So it starts in the schools and becomes official in 1916, and it's also a patriotic holiday. Uh, but tellingly, it is called Flag Day. And it is explicitly about the celebration of the United States as a nation. It's a way of sort of healing after the Civil War with no mention of empire. And the object that school children venerate is um, the flag with one star for every state, but no mention at all of territories. And I think that's really emblematic of the way in which the United States has kind of resolved its political discomfort with, um, with having territories and with having all these military bases all over by just kind of not talking about them. Um, so there's a real pernicious history of, of mainland's just life ignorance about the territories. And I, I sort of mentioned these moments over and over again where mainlanders just seem perplexed when they discover that, oh yeah, Puerto Rico is I guess, technically part of the United States. Huh, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, and and I, we see that still today. Um, and it's, it's, it's part of how um, people are, you know, children are educated, how I was educated. Uh, in mainland schools, I mean, I mentioned the sort of map thing as 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 being one part of it, but you know, it's it's how the textbooks are written, um, and the military bases are are an interesting part of that because unless you are unless you have served in the military, it is so easy not to know anything about them. It is so easy for them to just be a few dots that you might be sort of vaguely aware that some of them exist, but really have no idea of what it means uh, for the United States to have these little pinpricks of sovereignty or semi sovereignty in other people's countries. But the second you think about what it would mean for another country to station its military base in the United States, then it becomes very clear, right? If you think about, you know, how Texans would feel uh, if China wanted to put a military base outside of Houston, that would not go over very well. Um, so, I mean, my hope is that, you know, writing a book could, could help, um, you know, people from the mainland the United States unhide or, or see uh, the empire that's been there all the time. Um, see it not just today, but also see it in history and realize actually how much of US history doesn't really make sense unless you get the um, whole United States into view. Yeah, you've just touched on it then. I just wanted, wanted to ask like, um, what impact do you want your book to have on academics and scholars who study the United States? Yeah, um, it, it, there's, there's a kind of modest version of that, which is the it's a plea for more people to pay attention to, study, read about um, the overseas parts of the United States, right? And I'd certainly be happy with that uh, if that were if that were the result. But um, but I, I, it's not just a plea for you know a turn to a new topic. I think it's also a plea for just a new way of seeing. I want people when they think about the United States to remap it in their minds, uh, you know, in the same way that it used to be that you know a long time ago, uh, U.S. historians were quite comfortable telling U.S. history is just the story of white people. In North America, and then you know, then we had a lot of historiographic fights, and and rightly so. And and now it is absolutely essential if you're talking about U.S. history to acknowledge that you know, black people play this huge role in U.S. history, even when they have not been no numerically a major part of the population. Um, and so I'm hoping that U.S. historians, even those who don't specialize in you know, Philippine history, uh, will just sort of recognize this as as a major dimension and a major part of U.S. history. And uh, and I think that's a lesson that can be learned not just for um, you know my fellow historians, but that can be learned you know up and up and down the levels uh, of you know I'm, I've been really happy that the book has gotten readers uh, who are outside of the academy and. Um, I'm immensely proud that it is a book that is assigned in both graduate school seminars and in high schools. Uh, and the high school thing feels really important to me because that's how you learn about, or that's where I learned about, um, you know, the shape of the country. And, and, and if, if we just make this a kind of scholarly revision, then I think it feels a little less helpful. Um, so I'm hoping that, that uh, the book can help, and certainly it's not the only book that's doing this, but, um, but that, that it can help to, to lead to a sort of public rethinking about uh, not just sort of the character of the United States, who it is, but, but also where it is. It's probably too early to say, it's probably definitely too early to say, but I want to ask about the pandemic and what do you think that's yeah. re revealed about U.S. power? I mean, it, it's revealed a sort of cat candidness of, of U.S. government. I mean, something that those of us who live in the country have known for a time, but uh, has just been revealed in, in, in some of the most gross and horrifying ways. Um, 
And it also, you know, reminds you of how dangerous it is to have a polity where some lives just count more than others, just some people matter more than others. Um, and, and so it's not just that the United States has handled this very poorly, which of course it has, but it's that um, the poorness has been, you know, unevenly distributed. And there's been some populations that have suffered far more. Um, so that's, you know, kind of prominently true of um, the black population in the United States, which just, you know, has, you know, you are more likely to die of COVID if you are black than if you're white in the United States. Um, but, you know, another thing that's been revealed again is just how little attention and how little support goes to the U.S. territories, which are all poorer per capita uh, than the U.S. states, which suffer from major lacks of infrastructure, including public health infrastructure, and which, to my enormous frustration, still don't generally appear on COVID maps of the country. So I haven't checked this recently, but the New York Times for quite a while was maintaining a COVID map that showed you, you know, rates of infection in, in various states. And it was just a map of the mainland and Hawaii and Alaska. And they had the numbers for Puerto Rico and they just, you know, they had the numbers for the Northern Mariana Islands and they just, that wasn't visually how they were reporting it. Um, I just uh, saw another data visualization yesterday and I, I, I was able to talk to the person who created it, um, which is about food insecurity, which is, I mean, obviously it's not just a, um, a public health crisis. Uh, it's not just a disease. It's also, I mean, it's, it's, leading to an economic collapse that's going to have serious ramifications uh, in the United States, especially because our social services are so um, underdeveloped. And, and so this data visualization is of, you know, the racial and regional disparities of food insecurity in the United States. And it's, it's this lovely visualization. You can look at a map, you can see the differences, you can click on buttons. And I talked to the, the maker of it and I said, I, I couldn't help but notice that you only have the U.S. states on here and you don't have the U.S. territories. And she said, I know it's killing me too, but we use the data from the U.S. government and that's what they give us. I mean, they must know the information for these for the territories, uh, but nevertheless, that's still not part of the statistical self-portrait of the United States. And um, just in the same way that we're seeing uh, the black population sort of suffer from, you know, official neglect, official not mattering in the mind of a lot of leaders of the United States. Um, that's also true of the co colonial population and for the same reason, right? Yeah, the United States is a, a place where um, fortunes depend a lot on, on your race and, and how the, the sort of I, you as a person or the place you're in as a, as a place are regarded in the eyes of leaders. And that, that's enormously um, structured by uh, perceptions of race. I'm conscious of the time, so I'll finish with this one. Um, how does the U.S. empire shape politics today? Um, I think the, the main way it shapes politics is in the pointillist empire and these military bases. And, and you imagine that the United States is talking to other countries, is negotiating with them as a, you know, the United States is a sovereign country and, you know, Germany is a sovereign country and they sit down and they debate things and they have treaties and, and, and they're kind of coming to the international political arena as, as equals. But in fact, the United States has bases in Germany, a lot of bases in Germany. And that's just a major fact that uh, it's a major inequality. Uh, it's a major complication. It, it binds these two countries together in a um, kind of sometimes profitable, but sometimes quite uncomfortable relationship. It creates an enormous amount of resentment. I mean, you know, a lot of the uh, sort of Yankee go home anti-US attitude that uh, the United States is always surprised when it faces, but nevertheless faces all over the planet, has to do with the fact that it has seeded the world with its military bases. And it turns out that by and large, people don't like it uh, when the United States puts a military base in their country. I mean, the politics are complicated because that can mean jobs. It can mean sort of incorporating, being incorporated into the US military empire in, in ways that can be personally profitable. But um, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how, how much, like, most people in the United States don't get why there would be any hostility to the country. And I think, I mean, there, there, are, there are a number of reasons why there are hostility to the United States, but a lot of it has to do with this spatial aspect of it, right, uh, that it's so hard to see if you look on a map because you just see the, you know, contiguous United States and, and Hawaii and Alaska. You don't see all the other places where the Stars and Stripes flies. Okay, Daniel Imovar, thanks very much. Okay, Ryan, thanks so much.